Now I mentioned a, the issues of the willingness to administer the TPA and part of it is being willing to, someone being willing to take responsibility of that patient for an admission once they get the thrombolytics. Um, and the drip and ship policy that the stroke center has initiated, that is every patient who gets TPA is automatically guaranteed a bed at EMMC, certainly helps. Uh, the other part of that, and with that, the rate of administration went from 1% up to 3%. Now still not the 10% where we probably should be aiming for, but that's a tripling and we didn't add any more CT scanners. We didn't add any more technologists. We're not keeping people on call in the hospital, sleeping by the CT scanner 24 hours a day. All we did was say that there'll be no argument about this patient getting admitted to a bed. And so that's helped quite a bit. The other thing that I think is going to help quite a bit is telestrope. And that's access to neurologists at any time. It's web-based real-time consultation. It's been done for years in this region for trauma, for PICU. It's just like a phone consult, but there's video imaging uh, that allows for the evaluation of that patient as well. So the neurologist puts on their headset, they fire up their webcam. At the other end in the hospital, the nurse rolls the $10,000 webcam in the room and the doc's standing by the bedside, the patient's there. Uh, the neurologist says, go ahead and raise your left arm. And the nurse says to the patient, he'd like you to raise your left arm. And the patient tries to raise his left arm and can't. And the neurologist says, I agree, it looks like a stroke, and go ahead and clean him. And the clinician says, yeah, he agrees. He thinks it looks like a stroke, so we can go ahead and treat, just like we talked about. And so the patient can get their TPA. And the nice thing is, is this can happen in the ED. It can happen in the inpatient floors. And not only do you get that initial consultation, but the neurologist stays on, potentially, throughout the whole treatment. So when the patient gets better, the neurologist can say, Okay, where's the left arm? patient raises their left arm, wiggle your finger. I can't wiggle the fingers yet, but getting better. Or when the patient suddenly slumps over, they can go, oh shit, they will call a helicopter. This is not teleneurology, this is just management of stroke. Uh, if you want to know more, you can contact the EMMC Stroke Center. There was a statewide telestroke conference held in November of 2010. Um, was hosted by all of the accredited stroke centers and there was quite a bit of discussion there and quite a bit of material that came out that can help guide you if you'd like to have uh, your hospital be part of this. Now, as I mentioned, many of these patients will be dripped and shipped for a number of reasons and so interfacility transfer becomes very important and you need to be able to determine the level of care these patients will need. Most likely they're either going to be wicked sick and they're going to need critical care transport or this is going to be a non-PIFT transfer because it's not likely these patients are going to have PIFT meds running. So if they're stable, then they can go by a standard paramedic unit. Um, and that's going to be up to the sending clinician, but if they're not really, really ill, they probably don't need anything other than a paramedic transfer. Now, the question is, what's stable? And these are minimum, minimums about stability. So just because all these are true doesn't mean that the patient isn't, is stable, but if they don't meet these, then we know they're definitely not stable. The thrombolytics need to be done. The patient needs to have a normal mental status, not necessarily a GCS of 15. If they have an expressive aphasia as part of their stroke, they're not going to get a GCS of 15, but they need to be able to interact with you and clearly be aware of what's going on. There have to be no problems with the airway. The systolic blood pressure needs to be consistently less than 180 millimeters mercury without medications that require titration. And this is because your risk of a hemorrhagic conversion goes up somewhere in the 180 to 190 uh, systolic blood pressure range. So if their blood pressure is below 180, they have a risk of hemorrhagic conversion, but it's not that much higher than a lower blood pressure. But above 180, those patients are at very high risk of having a hemorrhagic conversion. And when that happens, they become unresponsive and they need airway management through RSI. So they need critical care transport uh, taking care of them at that time. And then also, I don't need to tell anybody, you don't want to have someone with a, an active GI bleed in the back of your ambulance. In route, you need to monitor their mental status and their blood pressure as well as their other vital signs. And this is what we do 
post TPA regardless. So depending on when you transfer the patient, maybe they got treated and an hour later you're rolling with them, so you're within the first two hours, or it may be that they were treated, they had complete resolution of their symptoms, they feel great, and so they went home or they went and sat in the back of the emergency department for uh, overnight, and now we're at 12 hours, so you're in the Q1 hour. But r depending on where you're at, either you're doing Q15 vital signs for the first two hours, or you're doing Q30 minute vital signs for the next six hours, or you're doing Q1 hour vital signs for the last 16 hours. Okay, I wanna talk about two patients now that have uh, come to the Stroke Center uh, that were transported by EMS. Both of them came in as code stroke notifications and this is what we're looking for. So the first was a 38 year old female at 17.15 hours she d developed sudden right-sided hemiplegia. She was at a picnic. She only had one beer and I, I know that's hard to believe that anybody could only have one beer but she had a stroke before she could have her second. But she developed this right hemiplegia slurred speech and she kind of slumped over to the ground. Her friends lowered her down. And they said now that doesn't look right. So EMS was called uh, was about a 27 resp minute response time and she had those findings so she had a positive stroke scale normal blood sugar and a little hypertensive but otherwise normal vital signs so the crew called ahead this was a pre-hospital code stroke she arrived at the hospital at 1810 so 55 minutes after the onset on exam still a little hypertensive otherwise normal vital signs and this persistent right hemiplegia she had laboratory studies that were normal she had a head CT and if you don't read a lot of head CTs, this is essentially a patient that's gone through a deli slicer and you're looking from the feet up. And so the top of the slide is the front, the bottom of the slide is the back. As you're facing the slide, uh, the left is the patient's right, the right is the patient's left. And what you're seeing is a normal looking head CT. The grayness there is normal looking brain. The white stuff around the outside is bone. If you see white on the inside, that's really bad. Either somebody hit them with a baseball bat and there's bone inside their brain, or it's blood. And those open areas are the ventricles. CSF is produced there. It flows around the brain, lubricates the brain, drains down to the back of your spine, and that looks normal as well. So normal head CT. She was eligible for thrombolytics. She got recombinant TPA, and within 15 minutes, her symptoms resolved. Now, why does a woman as young as she was have a stroke? Good question. So she stayed in the hospital for five days uh, and was discharged neurologically intact. So she is a code stroke success story. This is what we want to have happen. Everything flowed smoothly from the notification all the way through the treatment. In case two, it was a 56-year-old male who at 1345 developed sudden onset left upper extremity weakness, left lower extremity paralysis and slurred speech. EMS arrived about 21 minutes later. He had a positive stroke scale with those findings, normal blood sugar. He was hypertensive um, and all, borderline tachycardic. They called in a pre-hospital code stroke. In transport, they noticed that the left upper extremity weakness was coming and going, coming and going, um, but the mental status was decreasing and the left lower extremity weakness completely resolved. So they get to the ED about an hour later, patient's still hypertensive. Now he's moving all extremities, although clearly weak on the left and increasingly obtunded. So he's uh, rapid sequence intubated. His labs are unremarkable and this is his head CT. And what you can see is a massive amount of whiteness inside the brain and that's blood. So this is an interparenchymal bleed that's extended into the ventricles and um, we knew the punchline, but neurosurgery was called, and they felt this was not operable. The patient was admitted to the ICU. Uh, the patient's prognosis was discussed with the family, and they appropriately elected to withdraw care, and the patient died. So, again, up until the point where we had the head CT, this patient was an absolute code stroke candidate. Things flowed exactly the way we would want them to. It was ideal. And... It's just that we discovered that the first patient was a perfect candidate and the second patient had a horrible disease that we really couldn't have predicted. But either way, good code stroke cases. So in short, code stroke, you've got a patient who's got signs and symptoms consistent with stroke. They're not hypoglycemic. They have a positive Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale and those findings are new within the last 24 to 48 hours. If you see that, call in code stroke, doesn't matter which hospital. This is not a diversion protocol, so you'll go to the patient's hospital of choice or the nearest hospital 
unless that hospital diverts you because they don't have CT capability. And hopefully you'll get more patients treated. If you have any questions, feel free to contact myself, Rick Petrie, or the EMMC Stroke Center. Thank you.